My name is Joseph Wunderlich. I'm a professor of engineering, architecture, and computer science. This is an introductory course in high tech. Uh, this is my website. You can find me on the internet. We also have a Canvas database we're using for students here, but uh, you can't get access to that from external sources. I'm going to post this on YouTube. So I've, I've done things in a number of fields. I'm 60 years old. Uh, past 30 years have been almost entirely computing. Uh, so look at my syllabi. I've taught 40 different courses, different places. <clears throat> uh, this particular course, uh, 23 times here at uh, Elizabethtown College. We're going to look at processors. Uh, and then we're going to uh, pause and play a couple little short YouTube videos, uh, but uh, I will pause because it's the intellectual property of other people there. So, um, and uh, uh, and so first thing we're going to do is listen to an MP4. Now, in, on YouTube, you can get in the comments uh, the, to the PDFs and the PPTX with audio uh, links and or to those, and then you, they'll have active links. There's no active links in the MP4, the YouTubes, uh, but it makes for nicer. Uh, wrapping around with a lecture like this here to play the mp4 so i'm gonna play this one here and then we'll do the zen core play stop pause play a little video about that learn about Almdahl's law and scalability or the what's limiting scalability uh in shared memory processing symmetric multiprocessing uh which needs to be you know, addressed and then um as you're making machines more and more cores uh, assuming you're going to stay with SMP, which is most likely going to stay the case for a while. But then looking at how to break the bottleneck there by using a network kind of protocol inside the computer to deal with the uh, different cores. And uh, I haven't seen that implemented yet, but that's worth looking at. And then we'll look at recent Intel processes. Just go to the Wikipedia page. Uh, we'll just you know uh, uh, surf through that and then discuss that later. And then uh, time permitting, we'll play this video today. We might have to play that next time. So And this is something we'll go into more detail in other courses on the development of the parallel processing, processing uh, uh, enterprise servers. They were changed to networking had just become popular then, so the CEO decided to say everything we're doing is networking now, um, and large scale networking enterprise servers. And it's a detail there that uh, won't go into now switching from bipolar to CMOS for a number of reasons. Uh, primarily actually to avoid the cooling uh, headache of uh, the bipolar circuits that ran very hot. Um, and companies, large companies and countries that run their governments with these million dollar machines um, really didn't want the headache of the maintenance of all the cooling and it really wasn't that much difference in performance over time. It took a little bit of a performance hit when I went to CMOS um, inside of IBM but it was worth it for everybody involved. It's what the market demanded and the customers. This is a supplemental lecture um, to what we've already learned about uh, CPUs and selecting processors in this introductory course. Um, this uh, uh, is a couple key terms in here. Uh, SIMD means single instruction, multiple data, and uh, that started a long time ago, although uh, now we, we use it quite a bit more. Um, we learn more about this in advanced courses that uh, you can take with me past this course. Um, you can read and hear about a little bit of that. And then MIMD machines, um, multiple instruction, multiple data. There's actually four Flynn classifications, and these are two of them. Um, but the simplest is single instruction, single data. And then uh, uh, Multiple instructions, single data is more of a theoretical thing, I believe, a systolic array. So the, the two main ones for parallel processing uh, is uh, the uh, SIMD and MIMD. So you should know those acronyms. Here's an example processor in the not too uh, distant past, just a couple years ago, is the Zen Core by AMD, Advanced Micro Devices. Uh, two notable things here uh, is the low power, which is certainly a, a very important trend.
and uh, probably a little more interesting is that uh, the neural network prediction. So this was this is a novelty. Uh, uh, neural networks were not uh, something that was in mainstream computing until recently. I uh, made two of them 30 years ago. One was my master's thesis, put a patent application in for that. Um, began patent application for that. At the filed a disclosure document, and the other was a neural network uh, processor that I'll post a picture of here. Uh, on the next slide. So this is worth noting here that there's uh, you know, a neural network in this. And so um, it uh, builds a model of the decisions driven by the software code execution and then optimizes what's going on based on uh, learning what's been executing. And then it anticipates future decisions and preloads instructions uh, and chooses the best path for the CPU. So that's not a trivial thing. That is a new thing to be putting in uh, these processors. Go to our syllabus again here. And so everything I just mentioned and what the students just watched was this video here. Just type that in. How did AMD make Zen 2 faster? Question mark, you know, in your YouTube address URL L bar search. Uh, and now we're going to look at Amdell. So Amdell is talking about you know, uh, how we can scale when we have a shared memory. And so let's listen to that and then come back and comment. My name is Professor Joseph Wonderlich, and uh, this is a lecture on Amdahl's Law in computing. Amdahl's Law is um, essentially the law of diminishing marginal returns that you find in other disciplines. In, in economics, you'll see it where you get a little bit less for every little bit of effort you put in as you progress and put more effort in. So uh, in computing terms, uh, the speed up in computer performance, you're always trying to speed up the computer with different measures. We'll talk about a little bit in other lectures. Um, in, in a measured way, you're trying to, to speed the computer up However, you get less and less benefit for each uh, little bit of effort you put in. In quantitative terms, we have an example here. So uh, suppose you have a computer uh, and you have an old amount of time uh, to execute some code prior to implementing some new speed up feature. And you have a new time. And so the speed up is the Old, old, and new. And um, yes, the, the T sub new is the time to execute code after the implementation of a new uh, speed up measure performance. And so T new is the, equal to two things the, uh, uh, the part that benefits, uh, the, uh, the part that benefits, and the part that does, uh, does not. So uh, T sub benefit is the new time to execute part of the code. The benefits from the new feature and then uh, the time to do everything else. So for example, we'll plug in some numbers. So suppose we have a computer that has uh, a code segment that takes 100 milliseconds to execute. And uh, uh, you have some new hardware feature. I say this is a new arithmetic logic unit, a new ALU could increase the performance of 40% of that code by 10 times. So only a part of it's getting sped up. So what is the potential speed up of the entire computer? So before we did anything uh, new, 
and we had 100 milliseconds to uh, execute the code. And then the part of that that benefits is uh, increased by or decreased by 10. That's why you're dividing by 10 there. So 40% of the code is 10 times faster. So it takes a tenth as long. That's why you're dividing 100 milliseconds by 10. And so you have four uh, milliseconds for the part that's benefiting, which is faster. It's reduced that time. And then 60% of the code is still um, going at the 100 millisecond uh, benchmark we had for the, everything before we did anything. And so we have 60 milliseconds contributing to the T other. So you add them together, and the T nu is the benefit plus the uh, other. And we get uh, 4 plus 60 is 64. And then we plug into the speed up, uh, old over the new. So it took 100 milliseconds before, and now we're dividing by a smaller number. So we're going to speed up. So we're, we had longer time is T old, and new time is, is faster. And we divide uh, old by new, we get 1.56. So you can imagine if there was no benefit at all, then it'd be you know, T new would be the same as T old, and then you just have a one, so there's no speed up. So you want to have this number be as, uh, as big as possible. So 1.56 is your speed up. Notice it's not a two, so I'm not doubling the speed. And then when we look at a graph of this, we see, uh, Amdahl's law, where you have a percentage of code benefiting from a new feature. And um, you see the speed up of the computer on the y axis and uh, the increase in performance of part of the computer due to the new feature on the x axis. And you have different curves. So the first curve is you have 100% speed up. So uh, you can see that. Uh, you do, you do uh, twice as much speed for uh, amount you put it in. Uh, it's a linear curve, you know, you know, 45 degree angle is the, the maximum that you're going to get. But then you get a curve that, that drops off more and more if you have a smaller part of the code that actually benefits as you would expect. And then you can apply the same principle to the number of processors. So this is the same example, but it's showing that the number of processors uh, is not going to give you uh, a total speed up uh, unless you have 100%. And that alpha equals 100%. We're going to utilizing both of them. Uh, which we'll see in other courses that it's impossible really to get that because you have interprocessing communication, you have some overhead. So if you have a problem uh, you're starting up the computer and then you parse the computer and you put it on the different processors and different cores, you're going to have to communicate the answers back uh, and you know, share data between the different uh, cores at different times. So you're never going to get this 100% speed up. And that's the whole point of this uh, exercise. However, we're going to see that there is possibly a way of um, breaking Amdahl's law where you can get more. So we'll see that in a second. But just understanding Amdahl's law is the first thing. And that states that, uh, as we saw, with a code segment, a certain percentage of the code only speeds up, and the other part doesn't. And in this case, for this particular example, we have on the x-axis number of processors or cores, and you're typically going to have an alpha that's not 100%. You're going to have something else because you're typically going to have, as I mentioned, your processor communication and over overhead, other overhead costs. So that's the essence of Amdahl's law. OK. 
Okay, now we want to go back uh, into the syllabus and stay in our chunk of uh, things here that are related. And now we want to look at after we start understanding Ambrose Law uh, and law of diminishing marginal returns and how that applies to uh, uh, the parallel parallelizing part of the code, what your optimizing compiler can do <coughs> for you, and as well as the hardware that's in parallel and how that can be used as in a number of processors, uh, how feasible it is to scale and still maintain a performance increase at uh, expected levels. But here's uh, something we want to think about. My name is Joseph Wunderlich. I'm a professor of engineering, architecture, and computer science. And this is a short video just talking about this paper, Breaking the Multicore Bottleneck, which is referring to a way uh, to increase performance and somewhat overcome the scalability problem and the interprocessor communication problem uh, when you have shared memory uh, in an SMP type system. They have uh, their queue management device, and what they are doing is treating um, the cores as network nodes, where on a computer network and, and you know, in queuing theory, the more nodes you have, you can increase performance. So in Amdahl's law, uh, you have a, a law of diminishing returns, uh, you know, law, law of diminishing marginal utility in economic terms or any optimization, where you don't always get the same amount of uh, benefit from each incremental uh, bit of cost. And and that is found in, in Amdahl's law for uh, scalability and computing, where you're talking about uh, you know, the number of processors and how much speed up you get with each processor, each core. It also applies to the, uh, to the amount of parallelizable code and the hardware that can allow that as a percentage uh, basis uh, within uh, your optimization. Uh, and so what you see here is they're claiming that uh, you can get increased performance and improve uh, beyond the bottleneck, which is Amdahl's law uh, of scalability. The green line that were optimal performance, uh, ideal performance, is that you can't get more than twice the uh, speed up out of two cores or three times the speed up uh, out of three cores. You just can't exceed that. Uh, it's not logical. But you can uh, improve on what you see as the upper bound of Amdahl's law on the graph on this page and start bending it upwards with uh, more cores if you're doing this network type of uh, uh, protocol, this network uh, routing, uh, queuing theory, uh, you know, internet uh, packet routing, packet routing uh, type protocol so applicable to traffic engineering and cars and uh, going intersections on a grid. So let's go back now and look at uh, where we are. Um, so I'm going to end the video here recording in a second and then play this video for the students. Uh, but I want them to uh, just skim over this Wikipedia link here, list of Intel processors and think about where we are, uh, the generations that we're at here and, and then the whole history. I could tell you stories about when I was actually using some of this stuff, not this, but back in here was when I was first getting into computing 40 years ago. <clears throat> so I could tell you stories on all these machines uh, but it's not really the stuff of course lectures. Just a fun story time for some of it. Um, okay, and then there's lots of details here. You can look at all the speeds and things to do with the cache sizes and everything. Um, well, that's another thing they mentioned in that last video that we watched on the Zen processors that uh, uh, the caches. The caches are now all in on, on the same piece of silicon uh, as the as the CPU uh, in the same chip package. Uh, for years and years, it wasn't the case. You had your uh, different level caches. The ones further away from the processor actually out on the board, and you had to communicate uh, to them you know, before 
you got to main memory. Now, now the L1, 2, 3s are all right on the same uh, silicon. Okay. Um, stop sharing here and stop recording and then play the video for the students. Let me just show the video real quick here again. I'll share again real quickly just for the sake of completeness here. Uh, it was in here, the video is a YouTube video that's called uh, Named right here, Intel's new processors and GPUs uh, in under 10 minutes.